briefly about the international monetary system, which is basically the arrangements, both informal and formal, that uh, drive connections between currencies. Um, it's important to note there's no world currency, there's no world government. Uh, basically, currencies are determined by countries, or in some cases, groups of countries. Um, and then any kind of coordination can be done through agreement or through you know people sort of following the same rules. So. Um, what an international system does is it provides an adjustment mechanism. It allows for uh, imbalances to be corrected, including uh, trade imbalances or ma other macroeconomic imbalances. Um, there's a book, I think by McKinnon, called Rules of the Game that goes through um, exactly what each country has to follow for the system to keep working. And if one country either leaves the game or breaks the rules, then the system might fall apart. Uh, generally speaking, there's a center to the the system, uh, it's been the dollar in you know recent decades, for a while it was gold, and that's the kind of thing that keeps it going. And then other countries kind of work around it and they can link to gold or link to the dollar. But uh, costs can accrue to that center, especially if gold starts leaving the country or if uh, the dollar faced pressure in the 1970s, and so the system can break down. And so a lot of times the, the history of the system ends with an old system ending and a new system beginning. All right, and the country in the center pays higher costs, and so uh, it all depends on who is in the center. Now, I talk elsewhere about the open economy trilemma. Um, basically, you can choose two of three. Um, this is sometimes called the unholy trinity or the incompatible trinity. But there's three things that cannot be simultaneously kept. Um, you can only keep two at a time. One is free capital movement. Another is ex a fixed exchange rate. Or the third is a domestic monetary policy. Um, most free market economists think that free capital movement is the good one to keep. Uh, but So that leaves that countries will have to choose between a fixed exchange rate or domestic policy. And having a fixed exchange rate means you sacrifice uh, the, your money to, to keep the fixed rate. Right? So you can't use money for domestic goals like fighting inflation or boosting employment. Stuff like that. So the interest rate, we can actually use the IRP or interest rate parity equation to show that you can only do two of those three. Right? So if you keep the rules, keep the system going, then, the, then it works, but eventually it'll fall apart. So here's the IRP equation. Home interest rate is equal to foreign interest rate plus the uh, appreciation of the foreign currency. Now, this assumes free capital movement. Now, if you want to get rid of uh, the, the free movement of capital, you can ignore this equation and say that every country is on their own. There's no arbitrage. There's no international capital flows. There's nothing that keeps these two equal. All right, if you, if you uh, build up barriers to capital movements, then you don't have price equalization, right? So this equation basically shows that you can choose fixed exchange rate, which means this is zero, or you can choose a monetary policy that is for your own goals as opposed to being linked to the foreign country, okay? So you can't choose R, right? Home can't raise their rates unless either foreign raises rates or uh, the exchange rate moves. And so keeping foreign equal, home raising rates is going to actually raise the exchange rate, right? So it's by definition not fixed. Independent monetary policy means exchange rate moves, right? Choose one of two, right? Now, like I mentioned, you, you don't have arbitrage, you don't have price equalization through capital controls, right? So it's really kind of a dilemma in the free market economist's mind. You can choose either the exchange rate or the monetary policy. Okay, so in history, there are basically four or five main periods. The one that a lot of people talk about, I talk about elsewhere, is the gold standard. It was an unofficial unofficial arrangement of fixed rates. There was no gold board. There was no um, government doing this. But, but Britain, other large countries, linked their currencies to gold. And then other countries followed suit. Right? And so the major currencies did that. Big thing about the gold standard was that there was actually a price of gold. The bank, the central bank, you could, would actually exchange domestic currency for gold. All right. Uh, for example, $20.67 was one ounce of gold. Um, <clears throat> another thing, you have free capital movements. Gold was shipped internationally, so gold could flow, put it on a boat and ship it. And so you had two of the three. Fixed exchange rate, there was a fixed price per ounce of gold, and there was international capital movement, but there was no domestic monetary policy. It wasn't even thought of back then. Remember, this is before World War I. This is the late 1800s, early 1900s. Central banks had no interest or intention of uh, lowering unemployment, for example. Right. Um, wars make the system break down, and World War I is inflationary. Uh, countries have to pay for troops, they have to pay for material. You can't print money unless you can print gold, and so they started to issue paper currency uh, that lost its value but paid those debts. Right? So that broke apart then. 
Second period is interwar between World War I and World War II. Countries went off the gold standard because they had to print more money than their gold supplies would hold. And so they tried to go back on, some went off again. Um, but the thing is, is that they kept their old exchange rate. And if war is inflationary, your currency should be weaker. Um, but they brought back too strong of a currencies, and that could hurt their trade. They had overvalued currencies. Right? And so this is the real exchange rate. If you have too strong of a fixed high exchange rate here, then you have a too strong real exchange rate, and that's a measure of trade competitiveness, hurt their competitiveness. Uh, and so countries were actually trying to uh, go into recession and like pass the recession on to their neighbors, all right, hurt their economies. Um, some studies have shown that the gold standard may have prolonged the depression for those countries that did it, and so uh, kind of advocates for a free-floating currency. Um, but there were trade wars. People had currency blocks and trade blocks. They would uh, try to have competitive devaluations. They would weaken their currency to help their exports, which make the other countries' imports expensive, would pass on their economic problems to their neighbors. And so there was chaos that led to real war in World War II. All right, at the end of World War II, uh, knowing that what happened at the end of World War I, the major leaders... Um, a year before the war ended, uh, met in New Hampshire at the uh, Bretton Woods Resort to discuss the post-World War II system, hoping that there'd be stability and coordination, and as a result, no World War III. All right, so they set up a system of fixed exchange rates with the U.S. at the center, um, and so uh, the U.S. was had to pay those costs, and they also had institutions to maintain currencies and trade. And so the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, was designed to lend countries money to maintain fixed rates. World Bank was the precursor or the postcursor to the redevelopment agency. GATT, the General Agreement of Tariffs and Trade, um, was the trade agreement because the International Trade Organization never passed in the U.S. So they had a trade agreement that in 1995 led to the World Trade Organization. So it was mostly here I talk about the financial side, but there was also trade in organizations as well. But they, they tried to have coordination to stop the chaos uh, that happened after World War One. Right. This system was the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates and international organizations. The fixed exchange rates lasted until 1971 and 1973 when U.S. President Nixon uh, decided that the costs in terms of the gold and, and the U.S. Uh, you know, being unable to devalue the dollar, um, President Nixon left the system. And since then, the currencies have you know, floated freely for the most part. All right, the U.S. at the center had one ounce of gold at $35, and so a lot of times older people will talk about how you, you know, Fort Knox has all the dollars, really, because back in the 1970s, um, you could trade an ounce of gold for $35. That doesn't exist anymore. But the U.S. was at the center linked to gold. Other countries linked to the dollar. One dollar was four German marks, four Deutschmark, and so the other countries were linked indirectly to gold through the dollar. But you could change this if you were in another country. You could devalue. You could make one dollar worth five Deutschmarks, right? Uh, the U.S. could not because it was it had that set gold price, and so Germany had an undervalued currency, for example, that actually helped it um, recover after World War II. All right, so the U.S. didn't have that privilege. All right, a big thing about Bretton Woods was that it actually left uh, out the capital movements. It had restrictions on capital movements that lasted well into like the 1990s for some countries. So countries tried to maintain a fixed exchange rate and uh, independent monetary policy by limiting the other part of the trilemma, the capital movements. All right. The U.S. was limited. The U.S. had high expenses in the 60s. The 1960s, the U.S. was paying for the Vietnam War, and wars are inflationary, but also social benefits through the Great Society under President Johnson. Um, that would be inflationary. You would want the currency to weaken, but the dollar was pegged. So the U.S. was paying great costs, and eventually in the 70s, they left. All right, we were now in the modern system, post Bretton Woods, and older textbooks sometimes act like Bretton Woods is still going on, but we're well past that. Not all currencies float. Uh, until the mid-2000s, China was fixed to the dollar, for example, but um, the U.S. is still the center of the currency system, um, and uh, most major currencies like U.S., Japan, Europe, etc. float. Okay, Some countries that are like oil exporters pegged to the dollar, but for the most part, economists advocate for free capital movements and floating exchange rates. Right? Some emerging markets also do have those fixed exchange rates. All right, the euro is a special case because within Europe, every country is a fixed rate. France and Germany have a perfectly fixed rate to one another, and so that has problems if, if for example, Germany has high, high um, inflation and Greece has high unemployment. One money does not solve both problems at once. So the euro is a special case of a common currency, uh, which leads to a basically asymmetric policy that can't be done with one money. Right? And so you have to understand all types of exchange rate regime, 
A lot of textbooks just do perfectly fixed and perfectly floating, but there are others in between um, that are important to learn in international finance class.